Hello, everyone. Bienvenidos. Uh, we are, are going to start in a few minutes. We're just going to give folks um, two more minutes to jump on, and we'll start shortly at 535. For everyone just joining us, we're going to start in just one more minute, actually. And um, para, para todos los que nos estén acompañando esta noche, vamos a empezar en un minuto. Le vamos a dar a, la, a las personas que están esperando, que están um, llegando por, por vías virtuales eh, otro minutito para, que, para poder empezar. Hello, everyone. My name is Paola Martinez Montes with the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition. Welcome. Before I turn it over to ISDF partners and start with the program, ISDF has been advocating from our county that they are intentional about providing information to community members in their native language. So today we have um, some monolingual English and Spanish speakers, and it's important that we make sure uh, that on tonight's call, everyone is able to fully uh, participate and understand the information. So for those of you who are monolingual English speakers, I'm, a, I'm going to ask you first to look on the bottom of your screen. And you should have uh, uh, on the row, uh, on the menu button there, um, on an, an interpretation button, which, is, which has the icon of a, glo of a globe or, or the earth. And, uh, I want you all to click on that and click on, you, you should have three options. So one is off, one is uh, English, one is Spanish. So for those of you who are monolingual English speakers, I want you to click on English and that will ensure that you're in the right channel so that we can uh, easily go back and forth from English to Spanish when needed. So again, for those of you who are just joining us, we wanna make sure that uh, everybody on the call tonight has access to um, listening and understanding the information that we're going to share. So on the bottom of your screen, you have um, several options. One is an icon of a globe. And that icon, um, if you click on that, you have three options. So it's off, English, and Spanish. Go ahead and click English, and you should be, you should be in the right channel since you need English um, presented to you tonight. And now I'm going to provide that same information to our Spanish speakers on the line. So, bienvenidos a todos. Mi nombre es Paola Martinez Montes con la Coalición para Invertir en las Familias de San Diego, ISDF. Antes de empezar nuestro programa, para nosotros es muy importante que todos puedan participar y entender la información um, para poder ganar nuestras demandas. 
Para todos aquellos que estén con nosotros por medio de su computadora y necesiten traducción en español, en la parte de abajo de su pantalla verán uh, varios símbolos o iconos. Hay uno que tiene el, el icono de un mundo o de la tierra y dice interpretación en la parte de abajo. Si presionan ese botón, eh, van a tener tres opciones. Uno dice off, otro dice inglés, English, y el otro dice español. Y es una bandera, creo que de España. Si presionan el botón de España, entonces ahí ya van a estar en el canal indicado para poder recibir la información en español por ese, por ese, por ese canal. Para ustedes que nos estén viendo y necesiten traducción en español por Facebook, en la pantalla está apareciendo un número de teléfono. Eh, es, el número de teléfono es 1-888-788-0099. Lo está apareciendo aquí en pantalla. Y le van a pedir un código, uh, un conference ID number, lo que le llaman, uh, código de identificación de la conferencia. Van a uh, presionar los botones. Eh, que están en su pantalla siguiendo por el, el símbolo de gato y ya podrán escuchar la presentación en español y vernos, seguir viéndonos por Facebook. La presentación va a ser um, en la pantalla, está bilingüe, así que van a poder accesar los dos idiomas. Si tienen alguna pregunta, vamos a tener compañeros de, de la coalición en el chat uh, y por medio de Facebook y también por medio de, de aquí de Zoom. Eh, si tienen alguna pregunta o si tienen algún problema con la traducción, por favor, indíquenoslo ahí en, en ese, por ese medio y ahí ya vamos a poder eh, ayudarlos con cuestiones. So, thank you all very much. Um, I hope that those of you who are monolingual English speakers are in the right channel right now. E, y para los que necesiten la traducción en español, que también ustedes estén en el canal indicado. Eh, Usando, usando las instrucciones que les, que les acabo de, de dar. Y ya vamos a empezar. So we're going to go and, hit and get started. And to start us off, I would like to introduce one of our ISDF partners, um, Warsan, um, who is here to give us an introduction of uh, Invest in San Diego Families and the reason for why we're all here and um, anxiously waiting for the rest of this presentation. So Warsan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Paola. Um, can we go to PowerPoint really quick? So hi, everyone. My name is Swarsen, um, and I am with Youth Will. We are one of the ISDF partners. Um, sorry, can we go to PowerPoint? Or is it just me? Warsan, if you click on the gallery. Okay. Button. Or maybe it's just, maybe I just can't see it. But the PowerPoint is up? Yes. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay, so um, really quick, I'm gonna go over who ISDF is um, and why we're here today, like Paolo pointed out. So ISDF, um, if we can go to a slide with all the organizations on, on it. Um, ISDF is made up of 16 organizations. Um, our organizations work with, with San Diego residents, San Diego workers, small business owners, as well as members of the faith-based faith communities. We work together in order to advocate for our communities and to ensure that San Diego County is investing in our families, our communities, and in the services that we need. We are united under a vision, and that vision is to create a San Diego County uh, where all families can thrive, and a San Diego County where the government is transparent, accessible, and accountable to all families within San Diego County. Why are we here today? So let's go to the next slide. We are here today because um, despite um, the CEO, CAO stating in the proposed budget that um, a reckoning with racism demands an examination of our institutions, our policies, our programs, and how we engage and serve our residents. Despite the CAO or the G um, chief administrative officer stating that the county's proposed budget that was released on July 20th uh, maintains a status quo um, of inequities and inequalities that exist in our communities. 
and doesn't prioritize our brown and black communities. The county, even in a time where we're in the middle, middle of a pandemic where people are dying, you know, people are struggling to pay rent, um, to feed their families, where people are, are uh, forced, um, essential workers are being forced to go back to work despite not having proper protective equipment. Despite us being in a time like this, the county isn't taking bold action. Um, so that means we need to continue advocating for ourselves and our communities and that this advocacy and this fight is not over. So today, there's a few things that we will do today. The first thing that, one of the first things that we will do is go into the, propose, the county's proposed budget um, and what it looks like. Uh, we will also go over some of our ISPF or Infest in San Diego Families Coalition's demands um, and what those demands look like and what they are. And then we will go over um, why we need to center um, black and brown lives um, and black and brown communities as we do this advocacy. In addition to that, we will have a session where we get to hear from you and from your, um, like hear your ideas, your feedback as to what the county budget uh, um, policies and solutions should look like. What actions the county should take in order to better serve our communities. Um, last but not least, we will go over why it is important for us to come together in order to advocate for our communities together and, and fight for the changes that we want to see in our communities. Thank you. And on that note, I'm going to pass it to Grace from ACE um, to take it from here. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Grace Martinez. I'm the director of San Diego ACE the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment. Um, we are a partner of the ISDF coalition. So what our fight for the last year, and um, the budget um, fight is a yearly fight. Um, this year, many of us began um, meeting with county staff and officials to really have a county budget that's centered in equity and racial justice. For several um, decades, we, and several years, we've really pushed as a coalition to make the county Board of Supervisors prioritize the needs of our people. And when COVID-19 came, our demands became even important, important. So for many of us, I think we can all agree when it comes to resources um, for just our people, there's been a struggle to make sure that there's a real investment. And um, so a situ yes. We're having a hard time hearing you. Could you move a little closer Sorry. to you? Could you, is this better? Yeah, much better, thank you. Okay. So a situation that was already dire became devastating, um, you know, under this pandemic. We're, I'm gonna bring up a couple partners to talk about what our main demands have been um, and are the, um, right now during this pandemic. And I'd like to introduce first, um, Patricia Mendoza, um, our, one of our ACE members, to talk about economic security and housing for all. Patricia? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Can hear you. Okay, perfect. So hi, yes, um, again, my introduction, let me, my name is Patricia Mendoza. I'm a member of ACE and the Investment in San Diego Families Coalition. Uh, at ACE, we've been doing a lot of work to protect tenants and low-income families during this pandemic. <clears throat> One of the most important things we are asking for is for the county to create a rental assistance fund for families like mine who can't pay their rent due to COVID-19. We also need to create cash assistance fund for undocumented families in order to make sure we can help as many <clears throat> people as possible. Next slide. We know that 100 million is not enough to help all the people struggling right now. This is why we are also demanding that the county forgive all rent and mortgage payments for people impacted by COVID-19 like myself and my family. We also need to provide free housing and, un and unsheltered for unsheltered individuals, I'm sorry, 
and families <clears throat> and invest and invest in funding community organizations that will provide legal services for tenants, outreach and education. With this, we make sure our families have shelter during the storm. Our demands are not a wish list. These are community's needs. We are taking, we are talking about life and death for many. We need to make sure we do everything we can to push the county board of supervisors to invest in our communities. I'm glad to be here with all of you right now. I, I know together we are stronger. We need to keep fighting. We need to make sure our communities have what they need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. I'd like to ask um, Aaron from Mid City Can. Um, to present our Justice for All demands. Next slide. I was muted. Hello all, my name is Aaron Burgess. I'm an organizer with Mid City Can and the Peace, Prom Peace Promotion Momentum team. Um, I wanna share with you some of our ISDF demands uh, to have Justice for All, um, starting with the Restorative Community Conferencing Program also known as RCC. Um, we're advocating for $3 million to expand the RCC program countywide. Uh, the RCC program is an effort to stop youth from becoming system impacted and also to end the school to prison pipeline. Uh, the program allows youth uh, who've committed non-serious to moderately serious crimes to correct their mistakes and earn redemption while meeting face-to-face -face with people in the community that they've caused harm. Um, this program is offered in some of San Diego County zip codes, but not all. We would like it to be a resource for the entire San Diego region. Um, secondly, we advocate strongly that access to free telephone calls be provided for all individuals who are incarcerated. Um, and lastly, we feel that the DA office um, should decline criminal charges whenever possible and pursue diversion alternatives such as the RCC program. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I'd like to, um, the fight for justice and housing um, is, you know, it's some parts of what is necessary for a community, but we also have workers who must work during this pandemic. I'd like to invite Dr. Derek Robbins um, to talk about protect our all workers demands. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Next slide. Uh, in order to begin protecting workers, we demand that the county implement effective workplace health and safety measures for all county employees. This includes full compliance of all health and safety guidelines for county workers, including providing personal protective equipment, which can include hand sanitizer, disposable gloves, proper facing, face coverings, et cetera, while also ensuring proper sanitation of workspaces, uh, along with enforcement of social distancing guidelines and workspaces, uh, provision of information, training, and other support for county employees. And to further help uh, San Diegans, we demand funding to support community organizations. These organizations provide critical centralized support to San Diego workers, especially during this time of, of crisis. Uh, San Diego County deserves also an Office of Labor Standards Enforcement. This office will build direct partnerships with supported community organizations to help develop education and outreach plans for working people in the county. They will also have dedicated county staff who will help to provide the critical centralized support and education on labor standards and the enforcement mechanisms available to workers in the county. Uh, the office will also have dedicated county staff to manage and facilitate uh, county contract and evaluation processes, as well as dedicated staff to ensure compliance with the COVID-19 health and safety guidelines, along with other pre-existing standards for employers in the county. Also, we demand that uh, all businesses that are receiving county funds are required to adhere to all the new and existing paid sick leave policies. Workers in San Diego County shouldn't have to risk their health in order to provide shelter and food for their families. 
Also during this crisis, many workers have been furloughed or laid off, and we demand that all businesses receiving county funds must recall employees laid off during this crisis before hiring any new employees. These workers should have the opportunity to return to work to provide for their families and not worry that their employer will try to use this crisis to replace them with workers who they plan to, plan to pay less. Thank you for your time. And for Robinson, sorry. Sorry, Grace, just for those that are presenting, we, um, we wanna be mindful of the interpretation that's happening. So if our presenters could slow down just a little bit to give um, our interpreter the time to, to fill in. So um, as a good segue, with all the things that um, our community need during this pandemic, information is also an issue for our communities. And I'd like to introduce um, Karen from Youth Will to talk about our demands um, for information for all. Hi, um, yes, I'd like to talk about our demands for information for all. Um, just as we've been discussing the, trans the importance of translation and making sure that we're providing accessible information, the county should also be doing the same and making sure that all county communications, materials, and meetings are available and accessible in all these different languages to, to represent our truly diverse city. We're also wanting to hire a team of community emergency resource ambassadors. So this would mean that we're extending vital information to vulnerable communities. And because we're truly facing such, we're doing a remote um, webinar right now. We want to make sure that there's access to free, reliable broadband internet access for everyone because more and more things are being forced to go online. And this is going to help us bridge that digital divide. And finally, we want to release detailed, a detailed breakdown of demographic data on COVID-19 cases, the county's spending to address COVID-19, and the sheriff's department's budget. Uh, with detailed data, we can get precise patterns and therefore detailed solutions. Thank you. I believe I pass it on to Esme now. Hi, everyone. Um, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Esmeralda Flores. Um, I'm going to talk about the demands that we have around healthcare and support uh, for all. So we have four demands right now. Uh, the first one is to ensure no cost uh, COVID testing and treatment centers throughout the county, prioritizing low-income people regardless of immigration status. The second one is to provide free uh, menstrual products at county facilities. Uh, we know uh, that uh, period poverty refers to inadequate access to menstrual hygiene tools and education, and it primarily impacts low-income people and communities of color and has negative impacts to people's health and well-being. In light of this pandemic, as more San Diegans have lost their income and relied more on food banks and community resources to meet their basic need, it is vital um, that the county address um, this health problem. The third one is the creation of an Office of Immigrant Affairs. So we believe that San Diego County should establish uh, an Office of Immigrant Affairs that serves as a one-stop shop for county services for all of their immigrant population. Um, the office should have the capacity to develop programs and initiatives that promote permanent residency, citizenship for those that qualify, and civic engagement. Um, and finally, the creation of an Office of Child and Youth Success. Um, this office would coordinate and consolidate youth programs and resources in order to eliminate uh, the silos that currently exist and create a hub where children and youth service providers can convene to develop more comprehensive programming and resources. Um, and these can be also be utilized to develop comprehensive plans and strategies to make San Diego a world-class county for young people. Thank you, Esme. Um, so as we, these demands were crafted because of the need um, of our communities during this pandemic. But as I, just to remind everyone, and as I've said prior, is that we, there was, lack, there was a lack of investment prior to this pandemic and a bad situation became devastating. These are not simply a wish list, things that we wish we had as a community, but essential needs. Families shouldn't have to choose between food and rent. They shouldn't have to 
go to work with fear that um, they will get sick because there aren't proper protections. And people should have access to information and basic needs um, throughout the county to ensure that we survive this pandemic in a meaningful way. We pay taxes We um, in so many different ways that our county has to invest in us and make sure that our people are protected while we go th through, through this pandemic. I'd like to, um, I'd like to actually, hopefully, if you're not angry enough yet, um, I'd like to introduce Angelina from CPI to give a breakdown of, no matter, um, breakdown from the county supervisor, supervisor's budget and what they are um, offering to propose at this time. Uh, thanks, Grace. Before you, um, Grace, could you let me know if you can hear me or one of the panelists? I can hear you. Okay, awesome. Just wanna make sure. Um, next slide, please. Um, so hi everyone, um, before I talk about this year's proposed budget, I'm going to really quickly cover some general information about the county and county budget, just so everything is as clear as possible. What I always start with and emphasize is that the county budget is a really important document. It's not just a financial document, it is a moral document and a policy document that reflects the priorities of the county supervisors who are your elected representatives. Because the county government is a subdivision of the state, the county budget covers a lot of things. The county has to provide state and federally funded programs like Section 8 and foster care, um, regional services like public safety and public health services, and also municipal services to unincorporated areas. Um, so there are 18 cities within the county. Any area of land that is not part of a city is called in unincorporated areas. And because those areas don't have a city government to provide city services like road maintenance and sewer system maintenance, um, for those areas, the county steps in and provides those services instead. Um, so the county budget, which this year has a proposed total of $6.41 billion covers a lot because it provides all those types of services for a population of 3.3 million to the second largest county in the state. Next slide, please. The way the county provides all of those services is through four different operating groups. Each of those groups provides a certain type of services. So within these large groups, there are multiple departments that are responsible for, for providing certain types of services. Um, the county budget is also split among those four operating groups. The two largest groups are Health and Human Services, which I might also refer to as HHSA, and Public Safety. Each of them receive about $2 billion or about a third of the total budget. The land use and environment group receives about $652 million, which is about 10% of the total budget. And finance and general government receives about $729 million, which is about 12% of the total budget. There's also another 7.7% .7 or um, about $492 million of the total budget that goes to the capital program and finance other categories. But again, the four operating groups that provide county services make up about 90% of the total county budget. So that's what we tend to focus on. Uh, next slide, please. This year, the county's proposed budget, which they call a recommended operational plan, is a total of 6.41 billion, which is an increase of $159.2 million from last year. Um, I know this graph is a little bit hard to read, but it breaks down the changes by group compared to last year. The important takeaway is that the total net increase does not mean that there were a lot of new investments in programs and services. The net increase in the total budget this year is mostly because of the increase in the Health and Human Services group budget, which increased by $205 million from last year. This group houses the departments that receive money from the state and federal government for COVID-19 response. So that is the main driver behind the total budget increase. Um, and speaking of COVID-19, the pandemic is affecting the county's revenue because our local governments do rely on local tax dollars. Um, while property tax revenue hasn't been impacted too much, which is a good thing because it provides the most amount of money directly to our local government, um, sales tax revenue and TOT revenue or the tourist tax have been significantly impacted. 
Um, so the county was looking at a shortfall of about $230 million, less than what they expected to have. However, the state and federal government did step in. Um, this budget has, a, has about $115 million of the money our county received through the CARES Act from the federal government. Um, and the board will be voting on a, how to allocate another $48 million of CARES Act money um, next Tuesday, August 4th at the, supervisor, as the, at the Board of Supervisors meeting in case any of y'all would like to give input. There's also well over $50 million in other state and federal grant money related to COVID that's included in the budget. I don't have the exact amount, but I know it's at least over $50 million. Um, in addition to that, the county, as some of you may know, also has significant reserves. I was able to track about $132.6 million of money pulled from the general fund reserves to make up for revenue shortfalls. And there were also millions of dollars used from other reserve funds that the county has. So with those things, the county was able to preserve a good amount of its budget and operations. With some exceptions, the proposed allocations for most departments across all groups is only marginally different from last year. Um, again, with the most significant change being in the HHSA group. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, the HHSA group had a total net increase of $205.4 million last year. This slide breaks down the increases by departments within the HHSA group. The largest departmental increases were in administrative support and behavioral health services, which were also the two departments that received CARES Act funding. So administrative uh, support received $100 million from CARES Act money as well as about 8 million from other state and federal grants and behavioral health services received $15 million of CARES Act money, as well as about $20 million from other state and federal grants. Um, there was also a pretty significant increase in self-sufficiency services, which received about $50 million in additional revenue from the state and federal government. And a lot of that was um, for the increased enrollment in eligibility programs like CalWORKs, CalFresh general relief due to COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, like I said, the total increase in the budget is mostly because of the HHSA departments that received grant money for COVID response, but there were some other positive investments in this proposed budget. However, most of the major new allocations were to fund policy initiatives that the supervisors had already voted on and approved in the months before the release of the budget. So they weren't really new investments. Um, some examples of those are $5 million proposed for a new Office of Race and Equity, which was approved on June 23rd. This office was approved in response to the recent resurgence in attention to the Black Lives Matter movement. But you'll see a little bit later that this investment may from the county might be a little bit for show um, because it doesn't line up with the other choices that the county is making. Um, there was also $25 million allocated for the creation of a behavioral health impact fund, which was approved on Angelina? April. Angelina? Yes? Can I ask you to just slow it down a little bit for a trans uh, interpreter? Yes, I can do that. Um, and just let me know if it's not slow enough. So the $25 million for behavioral health impact fund. This is an initiative that was proposed by Supervisor Greg Cox in January and is supposed to set aside funds or to support capital or construction projects for mental health and substance abuse providers. This investment, while it sounds fairly positive, is a little confusing because after the pandemic hit, hit excuse me, the county did decide to pause and reevaluate all of its construction projects to make sure the county was in a good position to continue providing services because construction projects are so expensive. So it is a little confusing as to why this fund for construction projects is still moving forward since $25 million is a lot of money that could be used for more immediate needs. Um, there was $15 million allocated to essentially transition behavioral health services to be online, which was approved on May 19th. Um, this is a positive investment, but we as a coalition have been pushing the county to provide free internet access to those who don't have it and can't afford it. So it's unfortunate that low-income folks who may need these services can't actually access them. 
Um, and then there was $400,000 allocated for the development of a flexible housing subsidy pool. This is an idea that the county is trying to figure out with the regional task force on the homeless. With, um, and it would basically create a pool of money that could be used to provide rental and housing assistance to more people. Um, so they allocated $400,000, not for the program, but to figure out how to set up the program. There were also some new investments that were um, actually new that align with requests our coalitions has made or with our general values. Um, some of those include increased funding for the 211 info line, um, since they've gotten a lot more calls since COVID, um, increased funding for mobile crisis response services in behavioral health. Um, so it's positive to see that in the HHSA group rather than the Sheriff's Department. Um, and then there was also $23.7 million, $23 million allocated to address homelessness in the unincorporated areas. Um, so only folks in the unincorporated areas would qualify for that support. Um, so, they're all, so there are some positives. But overall, the proposed budget is pretty disappointing. Um, there is a big emphasis by the county on its COVID response, but the proposed budget did not address the shortcomings in the county's COVID response that community organizations have been calling out. Um, we're seeing massive racial disparities in local COVID cases, but the county hasn't made the investments in outreach and language accessibility that we've been pushing for, so they can actually reach the communities that they don't have connections with. Um, the county is investing in transitioning services online, but isn't investing in providing folks with internet access so they can actually get online to use those services. The county has been reopening and just telling businesses to follow guidelines, but there's no investments in enforcement of health and safety standards to make sure workers are protected and our communities are safe. Um, our county has voted to stop evictions during the pandemic, but our communities have been asking for rent and mortgage relief, and that isn't in the proposed budget at all. So this proposed budget continues this county's pattern and problematic history of making minor and little changes at a time when we needed transformative change. And on top of that, the county continues to make counterproductive and unnecessary allocations for policing and incarceration. Um, next slide, please. Um, this graph shows how general purpose revenue is allocated among the four operational groups. The county budget, um, really quickly, the county budget has different types of revenue that comes with that come with different rules and restrictions on how it can be spent. General purpose revenue is a pot of money that has no restrictions attached on how it needs to be spent. So the supervisors have the power to decide how this money is spent. There's a total of about $1.4 billion of general purpose revenue in the proposed budget, which is made up mostly made up of um, local tax dollars. So this, like the rest of the county budget, is um, literally your money. The graph on this slide shows how your money is being spent. General purpose revenue is disproportionately spent on what the county calls uh, public safety. Of the $1.4 billion of general purpose revenue included in the proposed budget, 59% was allocated to the public safety group. Um, and that's actually an increase of 47 um, almost $48 million from last year. So their general purpose revenue allocation went up. Um, and only 9.5 million, 9.5% of general purpose revenue is allocated for the HHSA group with no change from last year. Um, it's important for me to note that some of this is because the county gets a lot of state and federal revenue for HHSA programs, but it is still very clear that local tax dollars where the county supervisors have discretion on how they're spent are disproportionately spent on what the county calls public safety. Next slide, please. This slide breaks down what public safety means to the county. Almost 50% of this group's budget goes to the Sheriff's Department, which polices our communities and administers local jails. And over $200 million goes to the District Attorney's Office, which is responsible for prosecution. That is about 60% of the group budget, the equivalent of $1.2 billion going directly to the deadly and dangerous practices of policing and incarceration. It may seem like there was an overall decrease in this group's budget this year. That's what the county is advertising. But if you look closely, almost every department in this group saw an increase. The, sheriff's, the Sheriff Department's budget increased by $10.5 million from last year 
and the DA's budget increased by 22.8 million. These were the largest increase in any department that didn't receive money for COVID response, with the only exception being the Registrar of Voters, which obviously gets more money during election years. In addition to that, I also want to point out something about the capital program budget, which is a separate cat budget category for large long-term construction projects. More than 20% of the total al proposed allocations for this year are for detention facilities, so for projects related to incarceration. I always talk about the budget being a moral document that reflects the priorities of your elected officials. I would ask you to reflect on what priorities and morals are reflected in this year's proposed budget when our communities are looking to the government for support more than ever. A good budget should reflect the values and priorities of the communities that it serves. And my question for you all is, does this budget reflect your values and priorities? And that's all I have. I think next slide. Thank you, Angelina, for that um, wonderful, um, but really, um, terrible explanation in, in both ways um, about the about this county's proposed budget. Um, I want to turn it over to those of you who are on the call to ask um, Angelina some questions. Um, I do see some. Um, let me see. Go ahead and put your your um, questions in the chat and we'll I'll be sure to share them with Angelina. Let's see. There's a question here, and I'm not sure if um, what exactly is the Office of, em of Emergency? Does this pertain to natural disasters? Is one question. Okay. I believe it does. Um, the department description for that office says that it coordinates the overall county response to disasters. So they're responsible for alerting the appropriate agency when a disaster happens. Um, and I do believe that natural disasters fall under that category. There's another question. Thank you. Um, why are child support services under public safety and not HHSA? Um, so I think that's a great question. I don't, I, I personally don't have the answer to it. Um, but I, I think it does highlight one of the consistent problems we're seeing within the county government, which is um, services that should not be housed within the public safety group are housed within the public safety group. So we also see things like um, in um, response to folks with mental health um, issues being handled by public public safety or the sheriff's department, um, where we see um, dealing with the unsheltered population when, when the, the sheriff's department gets called when, when there's an unsheltered person and then they pull, rather than provide them services or support, they get put in jail or get fined and are stuck in the system. So I don't have the answer to that question, but I think it highlights like an important and uh, consistent problem that we see at the county level. Yeah, there's another question. Um, what steps can we take between now and when the county supervisors intend to vote on this budget and to action? They're getting, they're, they're getting ahead of us. Yeah, so we do have a slide on the budget timeline coming up, um, and I think opportunities for action will be highlighted by ICF partners throughout this call. Um, but really quickly, I'll say August 4th is an important date if you can show up to that um, supervisor's meeting and um, make your voice heard. And then August 12th is the evening budget hearing. So those would be the two important key dates for y'all to show up and um, uplift some of your community priorities. Yes, and we will definitely talk more about those two important dates um, in a little bit. Can you please review the fiscal year 21 uh, budget numbers for the operational plan, public health and safety, and discretionary funds? Yes, so the total operational plan, which is the total budget, was um, is $6.41 million, uh, excuse me, billion dollars, 6.41 billion for the total budget. Um, Public health, let me pull that up. The public health department is 
department within the Health and Human Services group. Um, its total budget this year is $17.7 million. Wait, is that correct? Nope, its total budget, excuse me, is $175.6 million. That didn't sound right, 179.6. Uh, discretionary funds, um, I'm not sure on what that's referring to. I, I will say that a general purpose revenue is a pot of money that supervisors have a lot of discretion over and that's about $1.4 billion total in FY21. Um, and if you repost your question, I can try to answer it if I, if I missed it. I'm gonna take one more question uh, during the section. And we're going to have a little bit more time um, as we move uh, as we move along. Um, there's a question being asked: Are we asking the board the board to fund our priorities by dipping into the reserves, asking for the sheriff's and DA's office increase to be reduced or eliminated, or both? I would say both. Um, the The county used a lot of its reserves this year to balance the but to balance the budget and make sure. Um, they, it didn't have to cut services. Um, so that means that that money is available to be used and the county is just hesitant to use it for new programs and services um, rather than for like a revenue shortfall. I hope that made sense. Um, and what was the other part of the question? General fund reserves and whether, oh yes, so we are, Overall, our, as a coalition, we do believe that there is a disproportionate amount of money invested in the sheriff's department, that those services should not be housed there and should be housed in other places, um, specifically the Health and Human Services Group. So yeah, we do believe that money should be taken out of the sheriff's department budgets. And we do believe that reserve funds should be used to um, support one-time needs in this year's budget, like a rent relief program, cash assistance fund for undocumented residents, internet access, just providing folks with things that they need um, to get by during the pandemic. Angelina, I'm just, just because we didn't get to any other questions that are on Facebook, someone said, uh, Jarell said, how much did they increase to deal with mental health issues? Ooh, that's, it's tough to answer that because we see increases in, in different in different areas. Like for example, the Behavioral Health Services Department, which houses a lot of the mental health services that are provided, um, their budget did increase by a lot, but $25 million of that increase was for the fund specifically for construction projects. So I don't know if you would count that as services because it's for facilities. Um, there's the two, what was it? Two million dollar increase for mobile crisis response services and behavioral health services. So that was an increase tied to services. But beyond that, it's difficult to break down which of the increases um, actually went for which programs and services because the county budget usually doesn't provide too much detail on that. Um, so I can see some, but I can't get, have a comprehensive picture. Okay, and I I see some other questions. I'm gonna leave them um, I'm gonna leave them in the chat, um, and we'll come back to them. But I want to move us along um, into the. Uh, there's a lot of questions about um, what else can be done uh, from now until when you know the board makes um, makes a decision or votes on this budget. So I want to make sure that we get to those questions or to that, um, and then we'll we'll leave it open for additional questions at the end. So Angelina, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Um, and keep putting your questions in the chat. We'll get to them um, at the end of this. Okay, so the the budget process this year was pushed back by the county in order so they could assess the impacts of COVID and it, um, the county's financial status. The first draft of the budget was released on Monday, July 20th. Next Tuesday, August 4th is a pretty significant board meeting. The supervisors will be deciding on how to allocate another $48 million of CARES Act funding um, in addition to other important decisions you'll hear about from others. So that's a big key date. On August 10th, 10th the CA, CAO presents the proposed budget in a public hearing to the board. Um, and 
it's during the day, so it can be difficult to attend, but we do turn out, try to turn out to that hearing if possible. And then on August 10th, the departmental hearings begin and continue for about the next two weeks. And that's where each department presents its budget to the board in a public hearing. Um, we Ideally, we would be attending all of each of the department hearings and, and reinforcing our message and advocating for our priorities, but that's not always possible given our capacities. Um, if it is possible for some of you all, I think that would be a positive thing to do. Um, and then the August 12th is the biggest date. It's the evening budget hearing. That is the only opportunity for public input into the budget that happens outside of regular working hours. Um, and that evening hearing is something our coalition um, had to fight pretty hard for. Um, and then the final budget is adopted on August 25th. So those are the key dates. And then one last note is that once the proposed budget is released, so after July 20th, in order to make any changes, four out of the five supervisors have to vote in agreement. So that's uh, an obstacle. And that's all I have. Thank you again, Angelina, for um, that presentation. I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Jose Lopez, um, uh, who is an organizer at ACE, lead organizer at ACE, um, to help us build um, or get to a, a greater vision of what um, winning a people's budget would look like. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jose. Thank you, Paula. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jose Lopez. I'm an organizer with ACE. I've been a part of the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition for over five years now, ever since I learned that the county had over $2 billion in reserve funds um, while our communities were struggling due to the lack of basic services like housing, health care, and good jobs. So like Grace mentioned earlier, um, this pandemic has made a bad situation much worse. And now more than ever, we need to make sure that our community's needs are met. Um, the demands that ISDF has been fighting for are demands that truly build a people's budget, a budget that not only weighs in on the racial disparities, but actually addresses them by allocating funds for programs that center black and brown communities. Now that we've heard um, about the ISDF demands, um, I would like to introduce Imani with Black Lives Matter San Diego to talk to us about uh, what a budget that centers the black community looks like. Thank you, Jose, uh, and thank you, ISCF, for um, inviting me to speak tonight. Um, so what does a, a county budget that centers black lives, like what, what does that look like? Well, I can tell you immediately that it does not look like the budget that Angelina just walked us through, right? A budget where 59% of our dollars, the, the money that we um, pay in taxes is going to um, the sheriff's department, you know, a modern day slave patrol that's responsible for the deaths of uh, too many um, black folks in our county. Um, and so what a budget would look like for a county that centers black lives is, um, is one that roots out the systemic anti-blackness um, in, in our county, in our culture, um, and in the system. Um, and so what, what does that look like, right? That's, that's a big task. Um, and so one, one thing that that looks like is, is identifying all the ways and all the areas in which Black folks are disproportionately negatively impacted by the current system and, and finding new solutions and creating those new solutions with community and also rooting out police um, and policing in our system. Uh, and what I mean by that is ending policies, practices, and cultures that are more focused on punishing than understanding why an action and a harm happened and what that indicates about our, how our society may have failed an individual or a community. Um, and so to really take that uh, into an even more imaginative um, and illustrative place. I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done um, as Black Lives Matter San Diego 
around our budget, our Black v. Black budget teaching, where we really um, invited the community to imagine what a budget could look like that centered uh, and defended Black lives. So uh, one thing that the community really highlighted they, that they wanted is immediate care in crisis. And what that looks like for them are things like 24 seven food pantries um, that not, do not center policing black and brown folks um, and don't require um, a bunch of documentation to receive basic, um, basic food um, and, and meet folks' needs. Um, and also supporting community organizations and leaders that are already responding non-violently to crises. Um, also ending lo the local food of apart apartheid. And one way that community members wanna see that happen is investing in community farms. Also, um, we need invest investment in, in rethinking the, our education system. And that includes um, calls to defund the school police in San Diego um, and also um, increased ethnic studies um, and really the complete history, right, of the Americas and the, and the world that does not center whiteness and uh, perpetuate white supremacist uh, lies and myths. Um, and also, and also um, the community really wants to see, see more investment in the arts from black creatives um, and performers um, and artists and activists. Uh, we also know that we need economic justice for black folks and that can look like a universal basic income, uh, living wage and reparations for black San Diegans. And uh, that also includes housing for all and addressing environmental racism. Um, and we also need to end medical racism and, and um, systemic anti-blackness in our healthcare system. Um, and that includes su anti-racist support for black birthing people um, and holistic anti-racist rehabilitation programs in our county. Um, and finally, around public safety and ending the criminalizing injustice system um, that we currently have in our county, we uh, some of the ways that folks want to see that happen is uh, free legal support for folks, um, nonviolent community-led emergency response programs, um, and holistic support for our community members that re are returning to us um, after being uh, incarcerated. So. Uh, we are very thankful to be um, given the opportunity um, as, uh, as a community organization to, to be included, included in this conversation. Um, and we um, invite y'all that are interested in learning more about um, the work that we're doing uh, to follow us. Uh, we're on Instagram at um, BLM San Diego. And we're also on Facebook at Black Lives Matter San Diego. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And I think I'm giving it back to Jose. Cool, thank you, Imani. Um, so now that we've heard from the Invest in San Diego Families Demands, we've heard from Black Lives Matter San Diego, um, we would like to hear from you all um, about what do you think, um, if we can go, yeah, um, what do you think that um, is missing? Uh, what are the budget priorities that need to be reflected uh, to make sure that our communities can survive this pandemic and thrive beyond it? Um, we're gonna go ahead and go with um, the first question if you all wanna put your answers in the chat. And I believe Paola or somebody is gonna join me on this section to put up notes um, as folks put their answers in the chat box. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna help um, pull all the answers together and Dr. Derek Robinson and Marisol are gonna be typing it into the Google Doc that um, we've got up. Um, so we'll wait, we'll give you all a few minutes to um, put your, your comments um, or your demands in the chat. Um, I am, I'm looking at the, at the chat now and there is a comment uh, from Delia who is telling us um, 
and this is why it's important um, that you're on the right um, interpretation channel because I'm going to read this in Spanish and um, if you're on the right um, interpretation channel, make sure that you're on the English. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, um, there are several menu options. There's a little um, world um, that has interpretation on the bottom. Make sure that you click on that and that you're on the English. If you're a monolingual English speaker and if you're needing translation in Spanish, que están estén escuchando la versión en español de nuestro de nuestro uh, de nuestra presentación. Yes, so, hola, mi nombre es Delia Contreras. Mi pregunta es, ¿qué piensan en, la, en las necesidades de bajos recursos como City Heights? Principalmente con la pandemia y la desigualdad ex, ex, existente Yo quiero que sepa uh, que se separen tres, tres millones de dólares para apoyar a nuestras organizaciones que trabajan con los jóvenes. Uh, que están trabajando con, con jóvenes de diferentes nacionalidades. Para programas que los ayuden a salir adelante. Oh, and thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing. Um, Elizabeth says uh, housing, food, and making sure people um, are able to vote next election. Yes, making sure people are able to vote um, is going to be incredibly important in this county. As you heard from Angelina, um, funds the registrar of voters. So making sure that they prioritize and that they have enough polling locations is going to be really important, especially in this election for the County Board of Supervisors, since there's three different seats that are up um, for election this year. And we'll talk about that in a second, um, about why that's so important. Uh, someone from Facebook is saying a monetary relief for under, undocumented individuals, $500 was not enough, absolutely. Um, and that is one of our ISDF demands is to create a program um, locally funded that would allow for um, for uh, assistance to be given to to those who um, who need it. Well, it's, it looks like we're all on the same page, uh, making sure that we have the community and social services that we need is is definitely a priority. Um, on top um, before um, incarceration and policing. Uh, I'm not sure if um, I'm not sure if this one was read already. We need much more investment from uh, Sophia. We need much more investment in HHSA, um, especially self-sufficiency programs, and making sure that those um, those services are accessible to all of our communities, and that and more money is divested from the public safety group. Gia. Um, is saying comprehensive support, um, comprehensive support and services for unhoused folks. Okay, uh, Parm wants to reallocate money from the DA's department to the public defender's office because they should equally represent both sides of the law. Yes, and as you, um, as you heard, um, the DA has um, a lot more money in their, in their budget than the public defenders. Um, there was a cut to the public defenders budget, if I remember correctly. We have a, a question from Facebook. What department would be best to help for educational support? from Crystal Grubber. I don't know if any of the panelists has the answer to that question. I 
We have a question from Paloma to all panelists. Will tutoring services for the youth be under this budget? Most parents don't know how to help their kids with homework and remote learning adds to it. Tell me about it, Paloma. Amen. And I don't know, um, do we have the answer? Um, any of the panelists can help us out right here? I, um, I don't know if that is something that the, I mean, the county could have, they don't have jurisdiction over, but they could always provide funds uh, to, you know, to the needs of the community. So um, I'm, I'm sure that school districts should definitely be looking at that. Um, um, let's see, did I, did we get everything? Any other final, um, demands that would that we might have missed or anything that um that would help us continue to center brown and black black communities um in this county budget definitely a lot about um a lot like jose said moving from health and human to moving um to fund more health and human services um over the public safety group We don't want any more policing and incarceration, do we? Well, um, I think we can go on to the second question, which is gonna be um, a really important question. Um, how do we make sure that our demands are met? We're, we need ideas because we've, we've done a lot. We've made phone calls, we've gone to meetings, um, We've done caravans, protests. We need ideas. We're running out of ideas on how to push them. Someone said we need to elect new people. Sounds like a great idea, Amanda. Yes, because let's be let's be real, right? There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of needs, and there are um, the board of supervisors, as we talked about during the first town hall, have been historically very conservative, um, and in, they they don't even represent um, they don't even represent um, the the communities that they serve, and you know some of them had been had been there 25 years. District one is going to have an election. Uh, to elect a new county board of supervisor for the first time in 25 years. Um, same thing in District 2 uh, with uh, Diane Jacobs, uh, Jacob, um, and there's a re-election in D3. Uh, Kristen Gaspar is the current supervisor there um, and has not always been uh, aligned to our, our values. Elizabeth, um, we continue to draw on this point, uh, perhaps letting them know that we will vote them all out, especially if they don't reprioritize the budget. Absolutely. The no, March sounds like a great idea, but we're just gonna have to wait a few months for that one. Someone is asking, which companies fund these officials? That's a good question. Let's, let's hit them. We're gonna have to do some research, Ben. Make sure you sign up for a mailing list so you can stay updated with all the information. Volunteer to help Tara Lawson Reamer beat Gaspar. Sounds like a good idea. Well, we're, we're, um, we're doing this from a 501c3 side, um, that was a comment that was in the chat. So we're just reading that off. Um, you all can decide who to vote for. Um, we're not endorsing any one particular candidate. Um, so you all decide for yourselves who you should, who you should vote for, but definitely do your research. Showing up in full force on August 12th. Absolutely. So August 12th, we're gonna talk about it again, but it's
the evening budget hearing last year, we turned out 600 people to that evening budget hearing. Um, and we, you know, we were able to, to shift some resources um, and, and we need to do it again. And, um, you know, that's the first step. If we don't do that, then, you know, we'll, we, have to, we have to prepare ourselves with a strategy around the election. But um, August 12th, is gonna, we're gonna have to show up in full force, especially with COVID and especially with, you know, the need that we have in our community. Any other ideas? Patricia says that we need to do caravans around their homes to let them know that we're not going anywhere. I was like, good idea, Patricia. That's a good idea. Who would join us for a caravan at, at the supervisor's homes? Someone else is suggesting we do a phone bank, a caravan mar march. I think we need to put pressure directly on each supervisor and Gore, uh, Sheriff Gore. Make them feel as uncomfortable as we as we do now. Absolutely. Okay, Drusella saying me. I'm gonna blow the I'm gonna blow the horns. So there's definitely a lot of energy on this call, um, and it sounds like we have been ready and are ready to take action. Uh, Delia Contreras, las comunidades tienen que saber qué está pasando con nuestro dinero, así que saber con tiempo para participar y se apoyar o, o, que nos, o hacernos escuchar. Y vamos a mandar emails en español. Oh, my, and she's also saying, y manden emails en español. So she's asking from us as IFDF to send emails in Spanish so that we are able uh, to inform our community on what's happening. So absolutely, we will, we will definitely, uh, we're taking... Um, information access very seriously and we will ensure that things are sent out bilingually, um, if that's a word, um, moving forward. Cool, so um, like I mentioned in, in the beginning, um, when I first joined the Invest San Diego Families Coalition, I didn't even know who my county board of supervisor was, even though he had been there all of my life. Um, and one thing that I've learned is that we definitely can't count on them to do the right thing. Um, anything that we've won, we've had to fight for. And ISDF has made some major changes in the past, moving elections to November. Um, we also um, help put term limits on supervisors. That's why we are able to vote uh, for new candidates now. And this November, we have an opportunity to put are the candidates on notice and replace our the bad apples on this board? Um, so make sure that you um, you stay connected. Um, if you're not part of any of any one of these awesome organizations that makes part of ISDF, um, reach out to us um, because we know that we're we're stronger together. Absolutely. Um, do you want to? Um, Tell us what's next. Yeah, so I'm actually going to turn it over to Cipriano, who's going to, um, who is with SEIU Local 221, um, also a member of ISDF. And like I said, it looks like we're ready for action. So I'm going to turn it over to Cipriano to, to walk us through that. Good evening, y'all. Um, buenas tardes, this is Cipriano with SEIU. Happy to be here. And so uh, what's it going to take for us to get an equitable budget? This is, as was mentioned in this uh, call earlier today, this is our budget. And so what is it going to take? How many of you are, are going to be able to show up on August 10th, on August 12th? Um, I want to see uh, people uh, putting in the chat room if you are going to be able to show up, give your comments, give your two cents about what needs to be a priority for our county supervisors. I know that last year I was part of this budget process. We turned out 600 people. And guess what? because we know that this is gonna be a virtual meeting, I think we can get more than 600. I think we can get more than 800. I think we can get a goal of, of getting a thousand people on the front from Chula Vista to Escondido, from Oceanside to uh, Lemon Grove, from, uh, from uh, San Marcos all the way to uh, Santee. So I see friends putting in the chat room, Don, Sophia, 
Uh, I see that Amanda's gonna show up, Crystal, and so many friends. And so with that, you know, I, I'm asking you tonight to, to please mark that uh, these two dates, the budget hearing in the morning will be on August 10th at 9 a.m. And then the budget hearing in the evening one will be on Wednesday, August 12th at 5.30. I see friends um, that are continuing to put in that chat room that they're gonna show up. And so with that, uh, we wanna also not just show up on August 10th and 12th, but we also wanna communicate with our supervisors, regardless of where you live in the county, regardless of, of whether you are uh, eligible to vote or not, we have our representatives, we have our five supervisors. So in a quick moment, we're gonna share a link on the uh, chat room. And this link is an advocacy letter to our supervisors, to the CEO. And we wanna make sure that they know what are our priorities. If we wanna see not just rent moratoriums, but rent relief, they need to know about that. If they wanna see that our priorities are about protecting the environment and having a good quality of life for all residents in San Diego, they need to hear about that. If, the, if our priorities are to making sure that we have racial justice, not just a, on a $5 million budget line, but across the county in all departments, guess what? They need to hear from you and then they hear from our entire community. I do see here that there's a hundred people on this call. Uh, and if we all bring in three people, uh, five people, or if we all send out an email, guess what? It's gonna make a dent and it's gonna make a difference. It made a difference last year. And I am confident that through our advocacy efforts and our allies in this call, from the ACLU to Mid City Ken and everybody else, that we can make sure that we make a dent and we make a change in this budget. And so uh, if you haven't seen the email, uh, the email or the link on the chat, please, please, please uh, complete that link, send your email to your supervisors. There will be a follow-up email that we will send out to you all so that you can complete and you can share with your friends. Uh, and you know, it, it truly does make a difference, um, especially sharing your stories. Uh, we heard from, from members about you know, wanting to provide rent control and uh, rent relief. And so those stories really uh, are powerful because they're real stories. We have a crisis in America. This pandemic has definitely put a light and a, a magnifying lens on the inequities. And so we need to make sure that this budget does justice to our community and that we push on these efforts. Uh, the next thing I'll mention is that there's a Board of Supervisors meeting this Tuesday, August 4th, 9 a.m. And the county is gonna vote on how they're gonna spend $48 million of COVID relief fund. How amazing and how great would it be if we could decide where those $48 million are gonna be spent on. And we have that opportunity to give our input. And we have supervisors that, that have uh, definitely helped us out in some areas, but guess what? They need to continue to hear from us. And so make sure that if you are able to attend, if you are able to listen in on August 4th at 9 a.m., uh, that you uh, dial in if you are able to participate and provide public comment even better. And uh, once again, we will send out those details. The other action item that is happening on August 4th is that uh, we're, we're having an issue with our uh, with the, the county. They're trying to outsource jobs from the medical center in our county jails. And we know that that's not fair to our workers and that these jobs should not be put as a for-profit uh, opportunity. Uh, that our workers who are, who are providing these services to uh, members in the community, uh, that they are good union jobs, but more than anything that these don't get taken away and put into a private company that's not gonna do justice by, by the members of our community. And so more information to come, uh, please show up on August 4th, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, you can call in from your home. And so you don't need to walk or go too far. Uh, you can do this at the convenience of your home. And the last thing um, I'll mention is, uh, is uh, follow us on social media. We wanna make sure we amplify our voice. You saw a hundred people on this call. I'm sure you all have friends and families that are aligned and that share our values and that wanna see a thriving San Diego, not just for a few, but a thriving San Diego for everybody. And so follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter. Uh, this uh, town hall was uh, live streamed on Facebook. And so share with your friends. They can go back, review at the content uh, we will provide the slide deck. You can have this information and share it with, with other people. And uh, you know, there's a lot of organizations that were involved in this event. And so uh, check in with them. If you're not part of any of these organizations, follow their work and make sure that uh, from now, August 4th, August 10th, August 12th, you have an opportunity to take an action. Let's be loud, let's be uh, on point and let's make sure that the County Board of Supervisors hears our message. At this point in time, I'll turn it over to Paola.
Yeah, so thank you. Thank you again, um, everybody who participated uh, tonight, um, to all of our uh, presenters and to all the organizations that are, are uh, represented on this call. Um, I uh, cannot stress enough how important the meetings that are coming up on August 4th um, and the, the, both the morning and the evening budget hearings are, um, uh, there's going to be, you know, the, that's one element. We're going to send emails, um, and that is going to, uh, we're going to send emails, uh, to board of supervisors. We're going to take action at these board of supervisors meetings. Um, the final vote, like Angelina said, is August 25th. So we can't, um, in Espanol se dice, no podemos dejar el dedo de, o quitar el dedo del renglón. We have to keep pushing. Um, so we're prepared to do, you know, we're, we're prepared to do that. Um, I'm going to open it up. We have a few more minutes. So I'm going to open it up. Did I freeze? You're good. Okay. It was Cipriano who froze. Um, so I'm going to open it up for all of us who, who were on the call here. I know that there were um, some other questions that we didn't get to at the beginning of this. So if our panelists can uh, turn their cameras back on, um, I'm going to allow for, um, not allow, but um, open it up so that we can answer those questions before you all go um, and make sure that you all are ready to go um, for, for, the, for the activities to come that ISDF is leading. And I know um, we talked about an action, a direct action, um, which we will plan with your input um, to go to the Board of Supervisors um, and put some additional pressure on them. Okay, so in terms of questions that are here, um, how do we know what to say when we call into the county? Um, that's a good question. So we're gonna, we're actually, if you continue to follow us um, or click on the links provided here to follow us on, on our social media platforms. And if you're signed on to our email, we will make sure to send out all the talking points um, that you need so that uh, those questions, uh, so that you, you're you well prepared um, to, to address the, the board. Um, I can't, I, I'm not sure if my, if my screen froze, but I can't um, scroll up to see the rest of the questions. And another um, question is, uh, are there top three asks for these hearings? Yeah, so we are, um, I, rental assistance is definitely a big priority for, for our coalition. Um, protecting workers is also a big priority for our coalition. Um, we're going to be those. We're going to finalize all those talking points um, tomorrow and send them out directly to you all. But definitely making sure that folks have access to food, shelter, um, and like we mentioned before, we created COVID nineteen demands um, at the beginning. You know, at the beginning of this pandemic, um, and they continue to be just as relevant. Um, there's you know questions that we still have on testing, so making sure that um, healthcare, like everything that's related to to um, providing health care for folks is going to be um, also another priority for us. I can't see the rest of the questions so if somebody would. Um, I've been uh, typing answers to the questions during the presentation. So that might be why. Okay. The only other question I see is, are you assessing the candidates based off the demands? Yeah, that's a good question. I, uh, we, again, right, like we, um, as, a, as a 501c3, many, uh, all of the organizations that are part of Invest in San Diego Families are 501c3, so we can't um, necessarily endorse a candidate, um, but uh, there are, Obviously, candidates that support the issues of invest in San Diego families, as if, if they, um, you know, stand with us on uh, being able to keep uh, families sheltered, if they stand with us with making sure that folks um, have access to the healthcare needs, to their menstrual products, to the health, um, to you know, an office of labor standards to ensure that you know workers have uh, the protections that they need. If they stand with us, um, you know, then we'll be able to to work with them. Um, moving forward. So we're definitely like that definitely weighs in on um, our ability to work with them. Right. So again, we can't, um, we can't 
endorse any one of these candidates um, here, but we do ask you, you know, use that as a, as a use our demands as a comparison um, to the to the uh, priorities that some of these candidates are putting laying out as their uh, as their um, campaign platforms. I hope I, I answered that well. There's oh. another question, and and this is can ISDF post on how this on how the supervisors vote on budget items. Can I turn that over to um, any one of you that are still here? Angelina, Jose. I, I think we can, right? Is that a CPI question? What's the question? Right. I guess the question is, um, can we post on ISDF um, how the supervisors vote on the budget? Um, I'm not sure on Wait, the on the icf website like the results of the budget decision yeah um, we should be able to do that yes yes cool thank you good question and, and just to expand on that um angelina the, the way the budget process work is either either voted up or they voted down correct um so the way it works is so the proposed budget was presented and the it'll be presented before the board on August 10th. The supervisors have until August 19th to submit what's called a change letter. Um, so they basically any modifications they want to make to make to the budget, they write them out and submit to submit them to the CAO's office. Um, however, for major changes, all four of the five supervisors have to be in agreement. Um, so they can either vote to make the change or not. Um, and then once the budget, all the modifications are made or not made, then the, fi the final budget is voted on or and it's adopted or not adopted. And in, once it gets to that point, yes, it can be voted down or um, approved. I will say that it's usually approved because the county does have a um, state mandated deadline of when the budget has to be prepared, ready by which has obviously been pushed back this year, but there's still a required deadline. There's another uh, question uh, about how do you uh, submit public comment? Is it calling? Is it submitting in advance? Um, and how do you, how do people get the information about these forms and how to call in? Paola, you're on mute. So, Again, we're going to be able to share that out um, in the in the next couple of days, uh, so that you all have it. You can you can actually write um, you e comment, so you can type in or you could type up your uh, comment um, and send it to the board. Um, you can also call in. Um, you have to register with the with the board um, with the clerk at the board, um, and they send you a link, and you wait for your turn um, to speak. Um, that you know. Either either one of those ways um, is 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 gonna is gonna help. I will say that there's been a lot of turnout, um, and we're just about ready to ra um, to wrap up. But there has been a lot of turnout um, from some folks um, in communities, you know, probably communities that are not represented by us um, that have turned out, and you know, they're the the non-believers of COVID, um, and they just want to open up the economy and get everybody back to work. So definitely being able to, to show up and, and call in so that we can counteract um, that message and that, and that narrative is gonna be really important. So I would encourage you if you can't uh, show up um, and call in during the meeting uh, to um, send your emails prior, but I would definitely encourage as many as you can, um, as many of you on this call to, to send your comments that way. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, that is the end of our of our town hall. I hope this was helpful for you all, and I hope you all are as ready as we are to fight for a county budget that um, is truly an equitable budget and that it centers brown and black lives um, uh, because that is the right thing to do and that is what our communities need. Um, anything that you, any of you want to um, share before we go? So um, this is Grace with ACE, and I appreciate the comments that people made about taking direct action. Um, so as for those who are still on the call, please connect um, with ISDF. We do want to
plan those actions to make sure that these supervisors who uh, need to vote the right way and, um, and apply the right pressure. Our communities are um, in a place where we're not asking for these things, we are demanding it. And what we have laid out as, you know, as what it looks like demands are essential to make sure that our communities survive through this um, pandemic. And that includes many of the issues when it comes to racial, racial justice and black lives. Because if we look at what this, the pandemic map, the, it, it is not a surprise that communities of color and black communities are more disproportionately impacted and so as we fight, um, we hope to make sure that you continue because this is a long-term fight. We have immediate demands and there's immediate battles in front of us, but um, I just wanna raise that up um, and I'm gonna curse. If you wanna fuck someone up, please um, get on the mailing list so that we can band together to make that happen. That's right, Grace, because when we fight, oh no, I caught you coughing. We win, maybe? That's right. All right, everybody. And with that, we'll we'll wrap it up. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. <laughs>